Hello and welcome everyone. I'm Lauren Shepard, Director of Events here at the Mechanics Institute. Thank you for joining us for our program, Writing Themselves into History, Emily and Matilda Bancroft in Journals and Letters. This author, Kim Bancroft. We're very proud to present this program with our co-sponsors, Payday Books, and the California Institute for Community, Art, and Nature. And I'm very pleased to have here, welcome back, Malcolm Marklin and Clara Greenfelder from ICANN. It's a pleasure to have you here. If you're new to the Mechanics Institute, we were founded in 1854, and we're one of San Francisco's most literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library on the second and third floors, our international chess club right down the hallway, and of course, ongoing author and literary programs and on Friday night, Cinema Lit Film Series right here. So please check our website, milibrary.org for all of our offerings, classes, courses, chess tournaments, and events. After our program, we will have a Q&A with you, our audience, and we will also be selling the books. So I'd like to introduce our special guest and talk a little bit about this book. Writing themselves into history offers a rich immersion in 19th century California, dealing with Emily Brist Ketchum Bancroft and Matilda Coley Griffin Bancroft's life, their life experiences in the public life, private life, motherhood, business against the backdrop of San Francisco's high society and the state's growth amid the tumult of the American Civil War. It's part of our California history. Longtime teacher turned editor and writer, Kim Bancroft has taught at high schools and community colleges throughout the Bay Area and also at the Universidad de Guanajuato in Mexico and at Sacramento State. In 2014, Kim edited Herbert Powell Bancroft's 1890 autobiography, Literary Industries, published by Hayden Books. She also wrote a biography of the founder of Hayden Books, the heyday of Malcolm Marlin, who's of course here. And also, um, she's also collaborated on uh, memoirs of two native friends from the Willits area, and uh, where she now lives in a cabin in the woods. Kim is also seeking to publish a book she wrote with a former classmate, David Waddell, called Same School, Different Class, a dual memoir of school integration. But right now, let's time travel with Kim Bancroft. Good evening, friends. So wonderful to be here and see you all here. Some faces I haven't seen in a long time. Well, I would first like to owe my thanks to the Mechanics Institute Library, and in particular to Laura Shepard, who helped arrange for this event to happen. It's a joy to me in this splendid place. It has its own incredible history. So more about the Mechanics Institute, if you have to already enjoy what you can. First, a few origin stories. I am, as we all are, privileged to gather here on this land, which would not exist were it not taken unseated from the Ohlone Indians. The stories I'm honored to share with you come from all across the West that belong to Native peoples originally, not to mention the Mexican people who next had their, their lands taken. So I first want to acknowledge our debt to the original peoples. May we never forget that what we uh, have here, and also that the Ohlone people continue to thrive. Now for my origins, I'm going to start backwards in describing this book. I called my epilogue, Climbing the Family Tree, 
because in the process of researching these women and their families, I discovered a whole lot of relatives I would never heard of. I traveled up and down California, sometimes with my father, Paul Bancroft III, called Pete. Here he is, excuse my sentimentality. I was seeking information, not only from archives, but also from some of the descendants of relatives I'd never heard about. And it turned out my father knew some of them and was able to introduce me on our travels. On my travels, I pull out my cheat sheet. It's a little blurry here. I, I run into some descendants who, when I showed up at their homes, would say, now, how are we related? And I'd say, well, you're over here and I'm over here on this family tree. In this case, I can point out here is, you can see Hubert Howe Bancroft at the very top and Emily Ketchum to the left. His first wife, Emily, he married in 1859 and they had Kate together, their only daughter. Emily died in 18, 1869. In 1876, he then married Matilda, my great-great-grandmother. They had four children, the eldest, a son named Paul. He turned out to be Paul Sr. I'm one of four of the children of Paul III. Here, but so there's H.H. Matilda, Paul Sr., and then there's Paul III, my father, and here are... Here I am with my three brothers way down there. Matilda also had four children, one girl and three boys. The origins of my curiosity about the women in the family came in 1966, when my father asked the then director of the Bancroft Library, Jim Hart, to take a tour on with his family, my father, my mother, my older brother, and myself. I was about eight years old at the time. Mr. Hart walked us through the mysterious labyrinth of the stacks in the basement of the Bancroft Library and then stopped by a few very old books with leather covers. He said that these books had been written by my great-great-grandmother many years ago about her children in the 1880s. So seemingly randomly, Mr. Hart pulled out a, a volume and open to a page. It was a book that she had written about her daughter, Lucy. Matilda was describing a scene in which Lucy's three older brothers were setting off for Walnut Creek. And this is when Walnut Creek was really just a creek. Mm -hmm. And they wanted to go hunting for toads and fishes. Well, Lucy, about age four, wanted to go too, but they didn't want her to lag on, as she said. So they, they, ran on ahead. Matilda wrote that Lucy was found on the road, quote, screaming at the top of her voice, the boys running away. Mama Matilda felt sorry for what she called the harsh, unfeeling treatment of Lucy's brothers. So I also had three obnoxious brothers, <laughs> and I also knew what it was to face certain limitations as a girl, even in 1966. I never forgot that impromptu reading. So imagine how magical it was 40 years later to open that same diary and see that same passage and remember Lucy. That was because of Teresa Salazar, the curator of Western Americana at the Bancroft Library. She was at an open house. There's a picture of the diary from 1876. The library had just undergone a renovation, and Teresa was standing by an exhibit of, Mal of uh, Matilda's diary that was under a protective glass cover. You can note her Nietzsche cursive, unlike my own. Teresa said, Kim, you should really come in here and read your great-great-grandmother's works. She was a writer in her own right. So I did as commanded, and Teresa was right. Once I began reading some of Matilda's diaries, I encountered names I didn't recognize from my then-known family tree. So I had to go back to the original. 
This is the original source that Malcolm and Heyday edited, uh, published the edited version of H.H. H. Bancroft's 1890 autobiography. This book, Literary Industries, tells the tale of how H.H. H. Bancroft, Hubert Cow Bancroft, uh, had founded the Bancroft Library. When I went back to that book and started reading it, I realized, oh my gosh, it, there was a wife I'd never even heard of, Emily Ketchum Bancroft, who had a daughter. They had virtually disappeared from my family lore, as had Matilda's daughter, Lucy. So why have they disappeared? Well, in a family dominated by a patriarchal man to whom all of the, the power and the property and the privilege was being passed along to the sons, the daughters didn't matter very much, not in those respects. That was not unfamiliar during that time. And even in this time, when we think about Iran and Afghanistan, the same is true. So we have come a long way in some ways. My subsequent investigation created a wonderful opportunity to read these letters written in private and semi-private and discover what they reveal about the lives of women, children, families, and communities long ago. Now, when I say H.H. H. Bancroft was patriarchal, Here's what he had to say about women's capacity to write. Writing, he said, is hard work, the hardest of work, not for frail and tender women. Constant pressure on the brain, constant tension of the sinews is not for women. Yet he had two wives who wrote prodigiously, conveying substantial information. They described the social realities they experienced, including race and class relations, their feelings when confronting hardships, and they had hardships, the nature of childbirth and childbearing in the late 1800s, what life was like in the still nascent dune-filled city of San Francisco, along with travels and trail travails far beyond the Bay Area. Despite H.H.'s critique of women as professional writers, we know that he did encourage Matilda to write about her experiences in her diaries. And because he was an archivist and a publisher, he made sure that both wives' writing was preserved, for which I am very grateful. How many of us can know in such detail the lives of our great-great-grandmothers or even grandmothers? So now we have these two well-developed characters from the past who shed light on the complexities of their lives. I'll, I'll share a little bit about each one. First, Poignant M. In 1859, H.H. H. Bancroft had a San Francisco store for selling books and stationery, which eventually became the finest on the whole West Coast. But at the time, it was still a modest enterprise located on Merchant and Montgomery Streets, not far from where we are, where the Transamerica Pyramid is today. So imagine this, you're 25 years old, single, already an old maid in some people's eyes in 1859. But you get a chance to marry an intellectual bookseller and go live with him in the new city of San Francisco, 3,000 miles away, leaving behind your beloved family in Buffalo, New York. Would you do it? That Emily Ketchum did shows the spirit of adventure she had in her. That gumption comes through in her writing. Now to get to her new home in San Francisco from Buffalo, Emily took the blue route. Oops. So here's, here's New York. So she took the blue route coming down along the coast on the steamer, crossed the isthmus of Panama on a railroad and came back up the other side, a trip that took six weeks at least and was not easy at all. On one such trip in 1862, for example, after having visited her family in Buffalo, Emily was returning to San Francisco with her then small daughter, Kate, 
While still on board, she wrote to her family about the journey. I see plenty of seasickness. As this ship rolls terribly, she's small and dirty. Yesterday morning was so rough that all we could do was hold on to something all day to keep from rolling over. Kate has just pitched over, chain and all. I managed to save her. <laughs> How laconically this mother talked about saving her small daughter from pitching over into the roiling sea. Another example of Emily's deep strength comes in an 1860 story about taking a horseback ride with her husband around the whole bay, starting in San Francisco. This shows the, the Bay Area a few, a few years later. Emily's husband, Hubert, wanted her to enjoy the adventure with him, so she went, knowing she'd suffer one of her perpetual, terrible headaches, the kind that lay you out. She wrote of the plan, it takes four days to go and come. We ride the first day to San Mateo, 30 miles, and about as far the next day, and so on. They propose to have fast horses. I expect to have the headache all the way. But as Hubert has talked a great deal about that ride and seems rather disposed to go, and as I won't be in fashion until I've taken that trip, I suppose I must. Emily had a no-nonsense side to her. This image shows Russian Hill in 1855, a few years before Emily arrived. Note the dunes. Early in her life in San Francisco, she sent a letter home disparaging the way women in the city seem to be, quote, so dragged and tired out. She wrote, I believe it is the hills. They are very tiresome. You can't go anywhere here without toiling up a steep hill somewhere. And then when a lady returns from a trip downtown, she is tired most to death. Now, can you imagine hauling these long skirts up and down the hills, no nice sidewalks, mud in the streets? That was tough. Here's an image of one of Emily's hundreds of letters and how they were found, now located at UC San Diego. Having left her husband, her family behind for her husband, Emily did all she could to explain to them what her new life was like so far away. She wrote one set of letters to her parents and another set to her sister, Kate. Realized that in those days, it would also take weeks for a letter to get from one post to the other, often along the same route that she herself had come down the steamer by, uh, down, by steamer down one coast across the railroad and then up the next coast. So that meant 12 weeks to get a reply to a letter. If you had sent news that was about something very significant in your life, perhaps a pregnancy or an illness or a death, you wouldn't hear back for 12 weeks. So nowadays when people say, oh, I'm sorry, I haven't written back to you, it's been a day, instant text, messenger, we have nothing over 12 weeks of waiting. Emily shared with Hubert a keen interest in what he called the anatomizing of human behavior. She sought to inform her family about how she experienced the variety of people she met from San Francisco's mayor to the girls who helped her at home. For instance, she praised her wonderful African-American helper, Adelaide, but Emily explained that she could not abide the Irish Catholic girls who were looking for work, showing her own prejudices. In relation to current events of the time, including the Civil War, Emily shared sharp observations. For example, she pinpointed a secesh referring to the many secessionists in California. In April 1864, on a trip to the then farm country of San Jose, Emily stayed with an acquaintance, a white woman who had been recently transplanted from the South. She showed a kind of laziness as Emily saw it. She wrote, this lady has, of course, been accustomed to slaves and knew nothing about work 
until she came out here four years ago. So she doesn't manage as farm wives do in general. It takes her an hour every morning to bathe and dress herself. So sometimes it's late before she gets to breakfast. Emily also wrote home in April 1865 about her shock at the death of the president. Oddly from a newspaper image and probably this one, she pieced together that in the theater box with Lincoln and his wife was Emily's old friend, Clara Harris from the Albany area. Another significant event for San Francisco at the time that she reported on was the 1864 death of Thomas Starr King, a famous minister of the Unitarian Church, only 39 years old when he died. This is an image of Starr King speaking on a street corner to give you a sense of his celebrity presence. Emily sought to bring her family into the movie scene of his death. We've heard this morning, she wrote, that Star King is dead. I could not believe it at first. He was a healthy looking man. I believe his disease was diphtheria. It was a sudden death and much felt in the community. He was very popular. He'd been prominent and given lectures for charitable purposes. He always drew a full house. His last lecture was to help pay the debt of one of our congregational churches. The flags all over the city are at half mast for him. Life in the 1860s had its particular dangers. Emily wrote about what happened to a riverboat that she almost took from Auburn to Sacramento and continuing on to Oakland, one similar to this. She said, I was intending to go home on Thursday, but aunt said, wait until Saturday. That boat that went down Thursday blew up, 40 or 50 lives lost, and a great number hurt. Wasn't it a narrow escape? Well, it actually turned out that life was especially precarious for Emily because she was harboring a mysterious disease. She reported dozens of headaches, as I mentioned before. We call them migraines today that were seemingly induced by eating cooked or natural sugars. Over the years following Kate's birth, Emily lost, it, lost two more babies at least. Here's an 1864 letter labeled, you'll see private on top, meaning she didn't want it read at home as entertainment as so many letters were, given there were few entertainments available. The letters were received and eagerly absorbed for days. Emily had given birth to a fine looking baby girl, but the baby died within two hours of her birth. The reason for Emily's wish for privacy with this letter was because she had explained to, to her mother that Hubert had bought a little puppy and brought it home to draw off her mother's milk from her painfully engorged breasts after the baby's death. By 1868, Emily was suffering wasting, debilitating fatigue, blindness. She died in childbirth in 1869, age 35. And she wasn't supposed to get pregnant again. Hubert had actually written a letter back to Emily's family saying it looks like she should not be ever pregnant again, and this is why. The diagnosis was kidney disease. So I asked an endocrinologist, Dr. Ryan Law at Stanford, how to understand the forensic trail of Emily's disease based on her letters, what she was writing home. He surmised that Emily likely had diabetes. And when he saw this photo, he noticed that she probably had thyroid problems as well. You can see the goiter on her, on her neck. When Emily died, she left behind her only child, nine-year-old Kate. And this is Kate probably age five. In his autobiography, H.H. H. Bancroft lamented, other men's wives have died before and left them as crushed as I was but mine had never died. 
and I knew not what it was to disjoin and bear that part of myself. After Emily's death, her husband lapsed into a long depression, though he worked on as ever before. At that time, at age 37, he began devoting himself and his resources to collecting everything possible on the history of the Pacific West, what he called his bibliomania. Uh, books, maps, pamphlets, government documents, oral histories. A couple of years later, he found relief from his ongoing depression when a woman friend suggested to him, the next 10 years will be the best in your life. What are you going to do with them? In seeking a renewed purpose for his life, Bancroft decided to make use of his growing collection of Western Americana, now about 16,000 items in his private library. He hired library assistants who helped research and write what would become Bancroft's works, a history of the Pacific West in 39 volumes, and you can see they're all as thick as that one. Now, one thing Bancroft was not going to do was remarry. By 1875, he was deeply at work on his histories. He said, my great fear of marrying was I should fasten to my side a person who would hurry me off the stage before my task was done, or otherwise so confound me that I should never be able to complete my labors. However, in Matilda Griffin, H.H. H. Bancroft found the perfect match Matilda was very enthusiastic about her new husband's endeavors, and her stories showed that she engaged as much as, pa as possible in his intellectual life as writer, traveler, historian, oral historian, teacher of their children, and even as a businesswoman. An intriguing aspect for me of reading these women's letters and journals was how they were essentially married to two different men, in a sense. Emily's husband was a bookstore owner, a businessman, and then a collector. But by the time Matilda married him in 1876, he now had this huge enterprise on Market and 7th Street printing and publishing, as well as selling books. And he had the men on the fifth floor, as he called them, the fifth floor now being his library, where he had continued to collect so much. They were busily helping him write the first of his volumes on the history of the Pacific West called Native Races. Matilda began her writing immediately. Here's that diary from 1876 seemingly at the behest of H.H. H. Bancroft, who suggested that she start keeping her own record of what they were seeing and doing. When uh, Matilda had her first baby, Paul, my great-grandfather, she left him behind in 1878 at, with uh, eight months old only in order to travel with her husband and spend two months collecting in the Northwest. They traveled as far as Vancouver by steamer and then returned south by rail, ferry, simple wagon, stage coaches. Matilda's diary from 1878 captures her thrill at new vistas and the intriguing people she met. For example, in Vancouver, she met Lady Amelia Douglas the Cree wife of the former Vancouver governor. Matilda learned about the different ways that Native women who had intermarried with European trappers became integrated into Canadian society, even at the highest levels. Matilda also described the perils of traveling rough roads and rivers, including a trip through Oregon's rugged mountains on a stagecoach much like this. She had one humorous story. While I think of the hardships of the immigrants 20 or 30 years ago, I hesitate to write complainingly of our ride here. As we started, though, 
The driver remarked to me that we would go down a pass that was as bad as any in the Rocky Mountains. That it was, going down into the bowels of the earth. She drolly noted how the driver enjoyed making the voyage even scarier by remarking that his horse would shy. She wrote, it would get awful scared, said he, and his collar don't fit correctly, so it might slip off. Uh, I mildly suggested, but your break will be your dependence. No, he replied, that's no good. I told them today it wouldn't hold and ought to be fixed before we started. Matilda concluded wryly, I think our driver wanted to impress us with his great skill in conquering difficulties. Matilda wrote five other journals besides that first one, including one for each of her four children, begun at their births and continuing through the first 10 years of their lives. Accounts of the cute things they'd say and do, what they studied under her tutelage, and the mischief they got into, which was considerable, especially with three boys, including burning down a barn. Matilda also used these journals to remark on where the family traveled and lived, including when Papa journeyed to gather sources for his histories. Matilda's diaries had practical uses as well. For example, Philip, the youngest son, often had severe respiratory distress. Matilda finally consulted a doctor, an expert, and she wrote, he was very much interested in the sketch I was able to give him of Philip's condition from babyhood. I made it out from this journal, which he said was a remarkable diagnosis from a layman who would keep such a record but a mother. Matilda also recorded the various remedies that were prescribed to her children over those many years, including brandy, wine, electricity, roaches in brocation, crescelin burned as a vapor, arsenic, laudanum, and cocaine. <laughs> so for all the many details that Matilda was capturing about each child and their whole family, note that these children were born less than two years apart, which meant she was keeping these simultaneous journal journals going, hundreds of pages, for several years. I dare not ask how many of us have kept journals and with that much information about our own children's lives or even our own lives. I have not. Matilda also became a property manager of sorts for the family, since both Philip and H.H. himself had these sensitivities to respiratory problems. They kept seeking a drier climate. They first went over the hills to Walnut Creek, where they bought a large tract of land, and then they, there they started to farm. Lucy, right? Philip eventually inherited that farm, and his daughter-in-law, Ruth Bancroft, developed several acres into an amazing succulent garden, which I hope some of you have visited, and if you haven't, please do the Ruth Bancroft garden in, in Walnut Creek. In their letters, I found great fondness between Matilda and her husband, and in many ways, they mutually supported each other. Together, they faced a terrible catastrophe in 1886, when Dan Cross's entire store burned down, and that's his store consumed by flames and smoke. Fortunately, He'd already moved his library to a fire safe location south of San Francisco on then Army and Valencia streets. In the aftermath of this disaster, H.H. wrote to Matilda about his concern for the 300 workers and how to forge ahead in order to keep them in work. But he was concerned about her worries as well. He wrote, you are a very good woman, Matilda, and are standing up splendidly under this great affliction, which seems greater and greater to me every day. But you don't tell me of your headaches and heartaches. She may not have wanted to burden him with her own problems, but he knew she had them. 
Years later, at the time of the 1906 earthquake, the family had a building in San Francisco comprised of small apartments there on, on your left. Its spectacular ruins resulted from the earthquake and subsequent fire captured in this photo on the right. It was St. Dunstan's at Van Ness and Sutter. Matilda had written many letters to her then adult sons about developing clientele and creating a, a welcoming cultural mecca for visitors or renters in the properties. She had some ideas about how to create the kind of cultural mecca, I would say, that Mechanics Library has right here. And by the way, you should note that the original Mechanics Institute was completely destroyed by the earthquake and fire, including, I believe, the entire original library. So we are now here visiting in the ashes, in the phoenix risen from those ashes. As I said, Matilda was a, a forward thinker, a dreamer and a schemer for the good. The family sought to sell this other property they had outside of San Diego, this one called Helix Farms. Matilda schemed to make it into a sanitarium or a kind of refuge for the urban poor. After listening to a lecture by Jacob Rees, who had written an 1890 book called How the Other Half Lives, a, a indicting depiction of urban slum conditions. And I believe that the lecture that Matilda heard was had taken place at the Al Alhambra Theater not very far from here either. In 1905, Matilda explained to her son Griffin her scheme to convert the farm into a beneficial social project. She wrote, I've written to Mr. Jacob Reese a strong letter, which I think will carry considerable weight and enlist his sympathy and help. I told him that when he was here in San Francisco, I attended his lecture and was very much impressed with his ideas regarding poverty and relieving or minimizing it and what an individual could do, that a great power for good was clear in my mind. I told him of our plan for the preservation of families and the prevention of sickness and consequent pauperism, and that to carry out the idea, hundreds of acres would be necessary and a large amount of money. Then I went on with an enthusiasm and faith in the project that I really feel. I asked him if he wouldn't come out to California and father the plan, give the project his support, and so make our philanthropists have confidence in it. Matilda's plan was never adopted, but it shows her far-thinking ability and her passion for promoting the good Unfortunately, she had to rely on her husband and sons in order to enact her dream, and they didn't. She never had the power or took it as a woman of her class and time. Two final comments on Matilda's works. Back in 1878, while in Vancouver, Matilda learned the art of being an oral historian when she began writing down the reminiscences of Reverend John Good. After having witnessed her husband and his clerks taking dictations or oral histories, Matilda said, I craved as a favor that I might take dictations, so have begun with Mr. Good. He has worked with wonderful assiduity. For five days or parts of days, I have written as fast as he would dictate. The experiences he related were themselves fantastic. From his stories, Matilda learned, among other things, about the struggles of the First Nations peoples there on Vancouver Island, what became Vancouver Island, and how they had suffered terribly from the invasion, poverty, disease. Two years later, Matilda played a crucial role as an oral historian in capturing the dictations of the Latter-day Saints women from Utah. Here's one, Jane Snyder Richards. She was the first wife of 10 of one of the elders of the church. It would have been improper for a 
for a Gentile man, non-LDS, non-Mormon, to ask personal questions of the family lives of these women. But Matilda elicited amazing information about the plight of the Mormon people, uprooted and often chased out violently from the East and then pushed further and further West. The women in these oral histories revealed the conundrums they experienced when their husbands wished to take another wife. Matilda captured how these speakers were able to reconcile through their faith the nature of plural marriage. She listened with a seeming objectivity to this perspective on polygamy that she probably didn't agree with. Yet she gave her interviewees all due respect. And until this interview with Jane Snyder Richards, for example, Jane explained, in polygamy, a man marries again from a sense of religious duty. He consults with his wife, and with her consent and perhaps recommendation, takes to himself another wife. His religion demands it, and all three enter polygamy with earnest convictions of it being done in the sight of God at his command. From Jane, Matilda learned that one purpose of plural marriage was to provide a husband to women who had been widowed. Jane said that after her own brother-in-law's death, I gave my sister to my husband. Now we were able to do much more for her comfort. It wasn't all easy, of course. Matilda also captured the sometimes painful details of entering a plural marriage that some of these women related to her. She wrote these lines about Jean from a separate interview. When the subject of polygamy was first talked of between Mr. Richards and herself, Jane said she could yield to everything but the children, that she should feel like wringing the neck of any other child than hers that should call him Papa. However, with time, she saw clearly that it was in accordance with Mormon teachings and it was not such a trial as she had first feared. These stories about the sister wives are, of course, very extraordinary and were fortunate that Matilda took them down. Finally, I'll mention one last important role that Matilda played regarding her help getting H.H. H. Bancroft's library sold to UC Berkeley. He gave his wife credit for her contributions to the sale of the library for she herself had met with some UC administrators and faculty in order to convince them of the value of her husband's collection. In September 1905, in a letter to his son Griffin, H.H. exhorted him to live up to his mother's example of industriousness. He said, work hard as your mother does in selling the library. The library was indeed sold in November 1905. Months later, in April 1906, in that major earthquake that devastated San Francisco, Bancroft's library fortunately stayed safe at the southern edge of the city. In May 1906, just a month later, it's now 60,000 items were ferried across the bay to UC Berkeley. Here is Matilda with my grandfather around 1909. Sadly, in 1910, Matilda Bancroft died relatively young at age 62 of angina, a heart attack. Her husband was already 68, and he would live another eight years. H.H. was described in his youth as a man of tremendous vigor and strength, which empowered his grand visions and projects. I think he just about tuckered out his wife, who was short of stature, and she described in her writing some ailments that she had that may have led to her heart attack. But Matilda was huge of heart and ambitions herself, and fortunately we now have her words to prove it. So thank you for your attention, and I'll welcome your questions. Amen. 
Thank you, Kim. That was absolutely illuminating. Um, we're going to open for questions. And if you have a question or a comment, um, we have a microphone and we'll send it your way. So any questions from our audience? It's great to see this parallel to Mechanics Institute history, you know, in terms of the timeline. Any questions? Here in the back. Oh, okay, good. Kim, in doing this research, what surprised you the most about her character? And and also, how did that change who you are as, as a woman today? How does that inform you? That's my friend Brad asking always good <laughs> questions. <laughs> Um, well, let's see. What surprised me, I guess, and you came in with this, the second part here about Matilda. So about Matilda, what perhaps surprised me was so many things. I mean, that she had all of these roles that she was able to play, that she was could be a businesswoman and oral historian, writer, teacher. That I have a whole chapter about how she was the major teacher of her children. And also following H.H. H. Bancroft, who went, who was peripatetic. I mean, he was living in San Francisco and Alameda and Oakland and going back and forth and traveling all over and finding information to gather. So the fact that she could keep up with him and was able to guide her children through all of that and write all of these books was fascinating. And I think for me, um, in terms of how it affected me, that there are so many times now that when we say, oh, this is so hard, or, you know, I, I couldn't get the bus, or I had to walk, or I live in a cabin in the woods, and I depend on solar power, and so I don't have electricity. Who cares about electricity when you think about what you had in 1890? So there's an opportunity for me to kind of have a bigger perspective about life, I think once I've immersed myself in their past rise. Question here. Hi, Kim. Hi, Charlie. Um, it's just fascinating insight into this family, this sort of pioneering California family, and just the abundance and repository of all these materials, just amazing. Um, in your academic journals and literary journals, have you just, are there other families in California that have this sort of, abundance of resources or is this pretty pretty unique i think it's i think it's true for a lot of families who you know especially during the early gold rush when people came out here there were a lot of uh, early settlers who were fascinated by what they were experiencing and seeing and then that became a, again a repository for their stories that have ended up in libraries and maybe even um, Laura, you could speak to any of the, the I know the original journals and, and a lot of um, amazing papers were destroyed in the fire, but you surely have gotten some others back that chronicle the lives of families who were here. Um, well, actually, we've had Elizabeth Partridge and, you know, her, I think her grandmother was... Imogene Cunningham. I, I, I mean, I'm oh, exactly yes. correct on that. And her father's the art photographer and artist. But anyway, but, but we do have a lot of, you know, biography, a lot of biography in the library. I'm not a librarian, but um, check out our catalog for California history. We have a great collection of California and San Francisco history uh, in the library. So we are a great resource for that. Any other questions? Question coming up right here. First of all, that was fantastic. Thank you. Um, so just yesterday we were talking about um, you're speaking at Stanford. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> just yesterday we were talking about how you'll be speaking at Stanford with Estelle Friedman, which is really exciting. Um, and I was saying how I, I thought it'd be a great textbook for a women's studies course. So if it is a textbook for a women's studies course, what are some of the um, kind of key takeaways that you think would be important for young feminist studies, um, studies students? I think for one thing, as I kind of mentioned about Emily and Matilda, to see the strength that women had who were coming to 
to into their own power, but in sometimes very private ways as mothers, as um, women who are trying to be a, have a role in their community and to see how this attention to detail can also be very powerful in writing down what it is that we have before us and what we can offer to the world. And there was, there was so many details in the book that I, I couldn't really obviously speak to in, in this talk, but Emily, for example, was a wonderful seamstress and she talked about all of the things that she was creating as, as a seamstress, as a cook, and the things that we can appreciate that were part of the private lives of women, as well as how they were listening to what the men were doing and supporting them. So I think there's, I think as a, as a young feminist, there's ways that we can look back at the richness of women's lives that have been ignored. It was really uh, wonderful. Uh, just, you know, the pictures, everything all together. But a couple of things. One, I was really moved and impressed about the whole idea that a letter could be like the evening's entertainment. But that was at the time that you would wait for a letter from the coast and hear all the latest and the same back and everyone would all sit around and listen. And, you know, it's, it's like storytelling. And you know, maybe now we're doing it on Zoom calls, but it's, I just thought that was really, it's really profound. And then I wonder, um, clearly the fact that both of them were um, married to someone who was creating books and they took the initiative, but did they have other contemporaries, other women who were also writing? And did any other women in your family pick this up? Are there other diaries that you know you have? Of course, which is fabulous, but is there anyone in between, anyone else who has a record of writing that you've come across? No, I don't know anybody else in my family. I'm sure they're they're there. I mean, a lot of a lot of us keep diaries that are places for us to disgorge some of our feelings and we don't want anybody else to ever see them. In this case, because Emily's letters were public, were semi-public within her family, then she was mostly conscious of what other people were going to be reading. So for example, there was the letter that was private about what happened with the puppy after her, her um, daughter's death. And there was also a letter that she wrote to her mother apologizing for letting her child go to dancing school because Emily came from a, a strictly Presbyterian family. And so that was, you know, she was apologizing privately to her mother. So there were, were some private things that were part of that, but she would talk about, oh, your letter arrived and I spent the whole evening going through it and reading it and Hubert was excited to read it as well. Um, she'd write her, I explained in the book, she'd write and say Monday and then write a couple of paragraphs and then write another page on Tuesday and Wednesday labeled them and then finally she'd say, the steamer is coming tomorrow, I've got to get this letter out. So there was this sense that this, there, there was this urgency of sending off these 14 pages by now that she had onion skin paper to make sure that the family was in touch with the latest installment of her news. And one another thing that I, I put in the book, there's another volume of letters from her parents to her, but paper, I and mean, we don't think about how, how precious some of these resources were. So paper was so precious that they would write in one direction and then turn it sideways and write crosswise on the same page. And frankly, I just gave up. I was like, no, I am not going to read all of these. So there's a rich source of research for somebody there. Other questions? All right. Um, love your talk. I'm curious, I know that you must have had to leave some things out. Can you share something that you do you wish you could have included in the book that just you didn't have room for or what didn't fit your overarching story? Well, there was one whole chapter. There was another diary that uh, Matilda wrote about the family's journey to Mexico in the late 1890s when the four children were probably 14, 12, 10, and 8. And I had written a chapter about that because I found it fascinating to see what 
Matilda found fascinating in Mexico. And some of it was, I mean, throughout the book, I was always interested in how she and also Emily would talk about race and class relations and how they saw their own positions as this middle class or upper middle class Victorian white family in relation to others that they were seeing out in the world. So for example, um, Matilda wrote about as they were taking a train through the Southwest, seeing some of the, the poor Indian people who would come to the train stations and her comments about how dirty they looked. And then being in Mexico and thinking that some of those families that they saw there were living in you know, dirt poverty and how could they stand that? So there was always this interesting thing for me to look at her assumptions about those others and try to put them in perspective in the book. Um, and there were a lot of other things she also had described in their trip to Mexico, but I have to leave all of that out. There just wasn't enough room for everything. Two things really quick. Just I apologize for walking out right at the beginning. That's because uh, another California pioneering family member was calling, trying to zoom in. It was oh. former Governor Jerry Brown. Oh, and he said he tried for ten minutes to zoom in. I said, Jerry, there isn't a zoom. Uh, <laughs> I, I this is all the time. time. It's all I time. Know him but you know, make sure he knows about the elders. Yeah. 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 But in yeah. any case, um, Malcolm had a question, and then I'm going to for him, which is, um, were the women happy with their lives? Did, did, were Matilda and Emily happy? That's a great question, and yes. So Emily, there are places that I, I speak in the first chapter about their relationship, and she says things to her sister about, Hubert is just the best old soul, I'm so lucky. And she really was lucky, because there were a lot of women who were sort of marrying somebody, a mail order bride coming out. They had so few opportunities back home where the family wanted to get rid of them and said, go be a teacher, go, go out west. And so the fact that she had met this man and really didn't know him that well, but that he was kind and generous to her was a real benefit throughout her life. And I would say the same is true for Matilda, that she just gobbled up these opportunities to learn and travel and to enjoy her opportunities to do all of that. And I'll just say, yes, there, there is going to be a Zoom presentation on March 21st through the California Historical Society. And I now have this cool website that Matilda would never have even understood, kimbeprof.com. And so that lists all of my events. And I'm also starting a blog about what it's like to live in a cabin in the woods in relative simple conditions, kind of like these women lived, and how I transmogrify some of those thoughts into what came out in the book. You, you really brought them to life for me. Oh. So it's, it's not just the photos, but the way you framed the story and 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 told their gave us their voices. And I'm very curious about your dress. <laughs> um, do you have someone naked? Tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> We've got I to get a picture of you, Kim. We've got to get a picture of you. I taught at high school. Um, and my, my friends here knew me back in the day. And I was the faculty sponsor of the fashion club which was really not my thing fashion at all but they needed somebody and so just so that you understand that that was my runway walk so i would i would watch these students doing their runway walks in their fashion show moves while i was sitting in the audience and i'd come home to my housemates and say look at what i learned today <laughs> Yeah, I don't think Matilda would have been doing that. But this actually is, I, I found a wonderful company called, I think it's called Recollections Online. And so you can order these kinds of outfits for not, not too much money. It's wonderful. Thank you. It is fun to play dress up. Your question over here. 
Well, that was fascinating. Um, and I'm really curious about your process um, because you know, there's a lot of volumes that you must have read and how you go about you know, constructing this, you know, the ideas that come into your mind as you're constructing this book and, you know, how you do your note taking and, you know, all of that stuff that really fascinates me and how long it took. Well, I will start by saying one of my sources of inspiration is here in the audience, Jabari Mahiri, who was my advisor at UC Berkeley. And I have a PhD uh, in education, and um, Jabari guided me through that process. So a lot of it is actually the same process. You do a lot of research, you're gathering from many, many sources, including interviews in this case. It was very interesting get, getting to meet some of the descendants of the, um, the family tree. And then going to uh, UC San Diego and to the Bancroft Library and other sources, and copying, copying, just transcribing, because you can't take these books out. And at first it was just this kind of, wow, this is fun, look at what Matilda wrote. And then it's more and more and more information. And finally, I you know, I wonder, well, is there a book in here? Is there a good story that other people would be interested in? Um, so there was an obvious organization of writing about Emily first and then Matilda, and then finding themes. And for example, in the case of Emily, is it? I discovered that she was continuing, uh, continually referring to these headaches and her illness, and finally dying. Then that that became the, the last chapter on her, her demise. What happened? How did this happen? How was it connected to the babies that were born dead, or came, or died soon after her birth? And then in Matilda's case, there were there were all all of these different roles. There was some. It, because the, the diaries were written in chronological order for each child, I had to kind of take them apart. What is, here she's talking about teaching, or here she's talking about traveling, here she's talking about doing these oral histories. Um, there, I, my work was cut short in some ways because I mentioned she wrote four diaries, one for each of her children, and the one about my great-grandfather, Paul, the oldest child, is missing. It was nowhere to be found. And so I found, however, in the other diaries, enough references to Paul to put together a section about him, as well as about um, Emily's daughter, Kate, who was about 16 when her father married Matilda. And so Kate was obviously a part of the family, referred to as Sister Kate throughout. So it was a, it was, 12 years of researching and writing and thinking about it and finding a way to organize much as I did with a you know a PhD dissertation I would say good question question so Kim's dissertation was over 500 pages long <laughs> <laughs> twice as long as almost any of the students working with but uh, what uh, my continuing friendship with Kim has inspired in me is, uh, and for us all, is that all of our families have stories to tell. It may not be as rich a set of documents that Kim has had access to, but I think we all would be remiss if we don't find, even when our grandparents or our parents are alive, ways to capture some of that uh, insight into what their lives were because it's really impacted our own, whether we know it or not. Yeah, if I can follow that up with one thing I learned because my father was so proud of H.H. Mm -hmm. Bancroft in the library and got us interested in oral histories. So I naturally gravitated to wanting to do oral histories. So not too long ago with Jabari, I said, he, he had visited and was telling me about his wonderful stories of his family. I said, I gotta put a tape recorder in front of you. And one thing that's been interesting to me for several people, and this actually includes Daryl Babe Wilson, who Malcolm had put me in touch with to edit his book. So there's certain, sometimes certain kids are really fascinated by old people and by those stories that they have. And Jabari told me about you know, going down to visit your relatives in, was it Kentucky? And they'd be sitting around talking and he, he acted like he was sleeping on the couch listening in on the stories. And so that storytelling is the oldest 
I think like the oldest art form. I just think about us all sitting a griot, a bard around a fire somewhere and entertaining each other. And that's what this is has been it's such a wonderful adventure of storytelling for me. Any other questions? Well, I have a question. Um, Kim, are you collecting all your emails for the future generations? <laughs> Apart from your incredible books and biographies and histories, uh, what are you leaving behind? Well, I do have some of those, <clears throat> some of those journals that are. Uh, I actually started. I started diaries when I was seven, and um, Harriet the Spy was a really great influence on me because she would she would spy on people and then write in her little composition book. And I actually did that. I went through through uh, the neighborhood and looked in one of my neighbor's windows. <laughs> and Mr. Clark had come into the room and was watching TV. And I thought, what if I saw him kill somebody? <laughs> Mr. Clark is not going to kill anybody, but I, I thought, oh, I can't, I can't spy, but I can still write. So I do have those diaries. Emails, we're losing a lot of precious documents because people do not keep their emails and they will disappear. So I have letters, including for some people in, in this room from many, many years ago that I'm keeping in and returning to people as, as a form of thanking them for their archives. Well, I'd like to thank Madam Bancroft for this amazing uh, presentation. <laughs> The history of the lives of Emily and Matilda Bancroft and really expressing their intelligence and their humanity uh, for us today. So thank you again, and we're going to sell books. Please purchase your books and have them signed, and we've got to get a couple pictures of you as well. Thank you for signing.